9 o'clock, I'd like to call the meeting of the select board to order on March 19th, 2024. First thing, additions and deletions to the agenda. Uh, yeah, we, uh, we have a few. Uh, one is the discussion about uh, sewer abatements uh, guidelines. Uh, now there will be a short-term rental update. Um, and the third will be um, a roadside marker uh, for Prosper Farm um, as well. Yes. And then I have one for just the update for the local options tax. Okay. Anything else? I hope not. Good. <laughs> Citizens comments. You have one up there? I don't see any online. Oh, okay. Manager's report. Um, yep. So first I'll say um, the police chief is supposed to join us today, but he had to have uh, a medical situation. Uh, not serious, but he won't be able to make it uh, this morning. Uh, so we'll try to get him on the uh, next meeting. Uh, a few things. One, um, a village meeting and election is today. So if you are a village resident, I encourage you to come out to vote. There is um, a contested election for the trustees. Um, and also tonight at 7.30 will be the village meeting. Um, and at 7, they're having kind of a social. It's going to encourage you to come, come get together, talk, um, and then stick around for the voting at 7.30. Uh, next, uh, there'll be a joint meeting of the board of, uh, select, uh, the select board and, uh, the trustees on the 27th, uh, to get a short term rental update from the planning and zoning administrator based off what the planning commission has been working on, um, the last few months. Um, so I encourage people to attend that. If you have any questions, I'm six, right? Uh, 6 PM, I believe. Yes. Uh, and if the meantime. If any board members want more information, uh, please reach out to Plan and Zoning and they can kind of give you the information uh, we have so far. Um, there will also be a Planning Commission uh, hearing uh, Monday at 7 p.m., uh, two days before that on, on March 25th, uh, which again, they'll help public comment on the potential ordinance uh, that will go in front of the boards. So again, I encourage people to attend that as well. Uh, this is the last of many meetings they've gone through on the subject. Um, all of them in uh, public. So I encourage people to attend if you have any questions or concerns. Uh, finally, on some uh, and on some good news, um, Stephanie Applefellow, which is our a newish uh, planning and zoning administrative assistant, uh, recently went to a course in Michigan. Uh, she took a test yesterday and passed. So she now has a zoning administrative uh, certificate from Michigan State University. Uh, so all very happy with her. Uh, it's gonna allow her to do more stuff internally help the town. Uh, so I just want to point out uh, all the hard work she did on that um, and her dedication to us. Uh, and hopefully uh, we'll see some more good things from her going forward. Okay. No, please, Chief. So, sewer abatement. First one is Kevin Mentris. <coughs> And 97, which talk about it. So on page five of your booklet, you kind of have uh, their email laying out what happened um, when we received the address originally. Uh, their address was incorrect. So when we put in our system, it was incorrect. Um, and that's why they did not receive a bill. Um, <coughs> I'm always the naysayer on these, so I'll just say my piece and you all can vote against me. Um, <laughs> at closing, you know, one of the attorneys prepared the transfer tax return with the wrong address, and that certainly wasn't um, the property owner's fault, but they should have also, someone should have also told them about the sewer bill. So I don't, I don't see that the town made an error here because they were given an address by a third party that was not correct. Is there a motion one way or the other? Somebody's going to make a motion. <laughs> I move we have, in this case, because there was an error, I would move that we approve the 
statement request for 125. Do a second. So the, someone can make a second, and then we, we, have, a, we have a vote. You can vote down yeah. as well. So making a second is not necessary. Agreeing to. I'll second it. Okay. All those in favor. All those opposed. Nay. 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 So you voted. You voted not to approve it. So now, prior to want to vote to. All right, so now we have to vote. We have, we have to make a motion. Yeah, I'd say vote to not approve it. Because the, the motion was to approve the motion, not to deny it. So. All right, so there is, is there a motion. Is there another motion? Move we deny the request. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So the next one. Um, no, you had to click on the digital version. I could be clicked on it. I figured it out. Yeah, the two person household, uh, they're being charged as a family rate and they request an update the status. Going forward or? Yeah. I, I think. I think they're going, they're, they're meeting for this to a bill that is currently due that got sent out on February 6th. <coughs> I think move to change it to a single family. Is there a second? Can I just quick oh. uh, move the single family for this current bill or going app going forward? Going forward, yeah. So they'd pay this bill as a family rate then after this, it would be? Yeah, because okay. we have known. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're making a change. Okay. okay. Seconded. I'll second the motion. All those in favor of making it a uh, was it two person rate as of next year? Next year's school bill. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. One high street. The so next is um, they can convert a two family resident to a single home. Uh, they're currently paying two syllable su two mm -hmm. su sewer bills and want that change to one sewer bill. Moving forward. Moving mm -hmm. forward. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion. One second. Okay, so the motion is seconded for changing one high speed going forward to next year's sewer bill. Make it a one single unit bill. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh. Aye. Oh, okay. Aye. Yeah. Did you have a comment you want to make? No, we just wanted to go ahead and shake around. Okay. Oh. <laughs> um, so the last one um, is kind of the, the typical situation we face with the way we do our billing. Um, so basically someone bought a property uh, this past August. Um, the sewer bill they receive based on the way we do our billing is for basically the previous August all the way up to that August. Um, when they did, went through the closing, uh, it seems attorneys did not fully realize how our sewer billing works. So they, I believe, I put in a small credit in the closing, but not the full amount. Uh, this is the Blue Horse Inn that they're uh, turning into a residence. So the sewer bill that the resident got is for basically the previous year before they were there, um, as when it was being used as a bed and breakfast or an inn, um, is now a single home. Um, Historically, the boards that I've been here have normally voted against these, uh, blaming the attorneys uh, at fault, not anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of the situation where we're, we're at. Um, I've talked to the attorneys, I talked to the, the residents on this, um, try to explain how we do our process. And uh, despite it being a little outdated, it's how we do. We have been doing it, um, and we don't have the cap cap capacity to change currently. Um, but that's kind of the, the best background to give everyone. Who are the attorneys? <laughs> Not me. I'm tired. Yeah, I think it's really hard when we have to base it on the water usage to yeah. play catch up with these. Yeah. I just think it is something that 
at least most attorneys in this area, I think, know that it's always a year behind and um, there should be some adjustment in the closing. Plus, they should have received the water bill, too. Yep. So the water company, I believe, is bills quarterly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is there a motion? I will make a motion to deny the request, but convert. Are they also asking for converting moving forward as well? They're on water. They're on meter, so oh, okay. automatically. I'll make a motion to deny the request. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion made and denied. Okay. We want to do the liquor licenses all at once. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them are tobacco as well. Just so, yeah. And tobaccos. Same kind oh. of permit. Yeah, so uh, tobacco substitute, which usually means something along like an e cigarette or vaping. So, do we want to do them all at once? You want to go from one, one, one at a time? And just for, uh, I understand the board's frustration on, on the way we get these from the states. Um, I did reach out to our, our contacts. Uh, I believe you were on that email as well, Susan. Um, and they're still kind of going with the same process we've been going through it the last year, which is we really don't get all information. And therefore, the board usually approves these with the condition that the state's doing the due diligence on their end. These have a little bit more, but not, not much. Not much. Yeah. Oh, my. No. And there's only four, so I would move we approve the Worthy Kitchen third class and the first class uh, based on the assumption that the state is doing due diligence on these. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Worthy Kitchen, yes. And I will keep going. I would yeah. move we approve yeah. Cumberland Farms of Vermont Inc. for their tobacco substitute in tobacco. Based again on the assumption that the state's doing due diligence. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We approve Shine Associates VT LLC for second class liquor license and a tobacco license, again, based on the assumption that the state's doing due diligence. Second. All second. Oh. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Move we approve Prince and the Popper, third class, first class outside consumption. Um, Based again on the assumption that the state's doing due diligence. Can I just, uh, do we know uh, with the outside consumption, do they have a barrier set up normally to block off? They have, a, they set up their uh, tables in the back end of the alley. So they don't si they don't set up on the sidewalk. They set up through the fence. You go through the fence? Okay, perfect. Because in the past, we've realized that the village has an ordinance that alcohol has to be behind a fence. and we haven't always followed that, so I want to make sure that we're. Sorry about that. Can you? I'm done. There a second? Okay, second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. That's fine. The next one is ARPA funding. Um, we talked about this uh, briefly a few months ago, and we put it on kind of the back burner. Um, we have gotten guidance from VLCT. Um, and what they're asking municipalities is to allocate the rest of your opera funds uh, by the end of March. And the reason behind that is April, the municipalities have to submit a new um, update to the Treasury Department on what has been allocated so far. This will be the last um, update before the general election in November, uh, where there are some concerns on depending on who wins that they'll try to claw back any opera allocations that hasn't been spent yet. Um, so the guidance has been if we can allocate it by March 31st, so you can put it in the portal by April, um, then it should be safe from anyone trying to claw it back after the next election. Um, so that's kind of why this is on the ballot now. Um, I'll go over some recommendations that we've talked about in the past and some new ones. Um, and we also do have the joint meeting uh, with the short term rentals in March if the board wants more time to decide. And also if you want to wait till April and you know take 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 the rest of your RC more welcome to do that as well. My recommendation you would not. Um, so uh, last time we talked about uh, allocating seventy thousand dollars to fully furnish the Carlton Hill Road updates. Um, I think the board wasn't fair of that. We never actually took a vote on that. <coughs> um, 
so I recommend um, that uh, David Green is here. He can speak to the tower estimate if the board wants to consider that. Um, give more detail on that. Um, Mark Hunter uh, would like to um, fix a lot of the sewer manholes uh, throughout the town. Uh, they've the way they've been done in the past. They kind of pop up and they cause issues. Um, so I have some money allocated for there. Um, um, I'm also asking for uh, the remaining uh, dollar amount, which is about twenty thousand uh, dollars for IT software internally uh, for Woodstock. Uh, there's about five different things we could do today with that twenty thousand dollars. We could have uh, accounts payable software that hooks up to Nemeric. We could have payroll software that hooks up to Nemeric. Uh, we could potentially have some permitting software uh, for fire, police, uh, my office, and zoning. Uh, we could also spend it on making this more Zoom friendly, uh, especially if the state government is going to require hybrid meetings going forward. Um, so I think it does allow us to do some things to kind of help upgrade our IT infrastructure. Um, so those are kind of the projects I've laid out. Um, currently, uh, the funding uh, it would be $19,500 for the tower estimate, uh, $70,000 for Carlton, Carlton Hill Road, uh, $20,000 for IT infrastructure, uh, and the remaining funds would be $16,044.97 are for sewer manhole repair um, is what I'm recommending to the board today. And if you have questions on that, or if you have questions about the tower, David Green is here as well. Yeah, I do have a couple questions about the tower. Me too. Chief, do you mind? Um, <laughs> <laughs> are you just at the podium, you come to the chair, whatever you feel more comfortable with. Morning. 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 So my questions are this is a house channel and transfer switch. Yes. So that's how it's on a generator? No. What's the transfer switch in the panel? We're gonna add the capability to a generator because right now during a storm, I have to go all the way up to the tower to hook a generator. It'd be much easier, quicker, and simpler to do it down where the the uh, meter will be, which will be right off the edge of the road. Um, any ca internet cable for the repeaters? Yep, so uh, the way radio's technology is working, they're all going to internet-based cable um, to do a lot of the radio work. I don't know how it works, but it just works that way. So we're not putting internet in, but we want to run the line and the conduit since we're digging anyways. Exactly. Might as well just do it and get it. Anyone else? Any other questions? Can you just um, explain the use of the tower and yep. you know how it assists? Because I know, like those of us that live in South Woodstock, know that we're certainly not getting cell service from it. Yep. So <laughs> it has nothing to do with cell phone. Um, what it is is the prior uh, primary antenna for police and fire in Woodstock and also surrounding towns. There's the main radio that's uh, antenna that serves everybody. There is an, a secondary one down here in uh, Blanky Cottage. But like I said, that's the main one that serves everybody in this area that the ambulance service services. So Pomfret, Bridgewater, us, uh, we also use it parts of place. Okay. And my recollection was that there was talk about putting a regular cell tower yeah. in that, around that site that would allow for co-location of different services. Yep, we'd love to have it up there, but it's too high. Actually, so the way cell towers work is you have an antenna sitting on a piece of ground and the signal goes straight out. It doesn't go down. So that will go above the village of South Woodstock, above uh, the town of Woodstock. So pretty much everybody has pulled back from that plan. There's still some looking, or I guess one company looking at using angled antennas up there, but it becomes more costly than the normal straight antenna. And then my last question is, I assume the town has an easement and yes. some kind of license to use the tower? Yep, so it's actually ours, we own it. Mm -hmm. um, we have an easement with the landowner who actually spurred this that because the uh, existing power line is direct buried and it's actually starting to come up in the ground in spots. 
and they use hay equipment. They have cattle or horses, whatever out there, and they're worried that it's either going to degrade over time or get caught on a piece of equipment because it was installed in the year. I think middle fifties, so it's been in there for a while. Yeah, and some of my questions have been answered, but the cell tower, I think, would be a great option if we could do that. If that were to happen, is the power line big enough to support cell? Yes, yes, uh, cell towers is very little. Right, right. but okay. I just want to make sure that yep. you know. Mm -hmm. if we could have one. I understand that the signals go out more horizontal than, than yeah. down, but there is a possibility with the technology we got now, we could eventually someday um, have that capability, which would be. Yeah, we're putting in a 150 house amp, um, and we only we don't even use 15 amps of power. Uh, so our tower uses very little. The cell tower we use very little. So there'll be sized wire big enough that we could add. Yes. To yep. Yeah, we can. Okay. Okay. Do you want to inspect them? John. Hi. Just a quick question. I assume that there's no way to, or sorry, is there a way to use the ARPA funds to? pay for some of the upcoming infrastructure costs like the sewer plant or the water acquisition or things like that? Uh, we have allocated um, not a lot, about $42,000 uh, for the main wastewater plant. Um, that was voted on um, back in May of last year. Uh, we also allocated $10,000 to the South Woodstock beautification project. Uh, so to have right now, uh, more money could be allocated to the wastewater plants, um, I would hesitate to allocate to the aqueduct just because we haven't had a vote on that yet, um, and that money is, would be set aside for a vote that could potentially fail. Um, hopefully, it would not. But uh, so I wouldn't recommend doing that. But uh, it could be allocated to other things as well. Okay. The, Thank you. The idea is one of the goals to get the money out of our account, though. So yeah, that the, one of the goals is to allocate it as quickly as possible and spend it yeah. um, quickly too. Any other questions? Thank you, David. Yes. Right. So, you want to vote on them one at a time or all at once? Do people feel ready to vote? I would ask you if you vote one at a time, it's better for for the track for for the treasury. Okay. okay. And so, there's one vote we have to do first, which is the board originally allocated one hundred fifteen thousand uh, dollars for the air packs. The yeah. fire department only spent. Um, Hundred six thousand eight hundred forty dollars and fifty cents on the apex. They were able to use some capital reserves and other things. Uh, so the first vote would just be re to reallocate that funding from one fifteen to the one hundred six eight forty fifty. I'll make that motion. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, so then we can go through the list. Um, Seventy thousand. I move we spend seventy thousand of ARPA money for the Carlton Hill Road project. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Next would be the nineteen thousand five hundred for the tower. I make that motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Twenty thousand dollars for uh, IT infrastructure. I make motion. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And then $16,044.97 for sewer manhole upgrades. I'll make the motion. All, all those in favor? Aye. 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 So that takes care of all our upper funds. Yes. Okay. So before we get into a food stock plant, do we want to yeah, talk hear about the, the marker? Yeah. The marker. Yeah. So I think people are here to talk about it. Yes, hi, I'm Leslie, as Leslie Asquith, Piastra. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, all right. Um, we, my brother's here with us too, Paul. Um, we, our family has been um, working with the local history center and the um, historical commission and the current property owner of our grandfather's farm out in um, Prosper. 
uh, to put up a roadside historical roadside marker. We're preparing an application. Um, the, it's for the uh, ski lodge that my grandfather, our grandfather built in 1937. And it's still there, although in pretty rough shape, but it has been stabilized, maintained by the Forest Service, the National Forest Service, because it's on their property. And, um, and it's been twice nominated or uh, suggested that it be become a Vermont, historic, a Vermont um, his, historical site. And that's been a, okay twice, 1992, I think, and then 2004, but it never went forward. So what, what we're doing now is not working on that particularly, but we're starting with a roadside marker we'd like to have put down on the road um, near my grandfather's farm. And um, the state historic marker program wants to make sure that the select board is aware of what we're make what we're trying to do and looks at the wording. I sent it to you. I don't know if you have it in front of you, but I did send some suggested wording. Um, the application asks us to suggest wording for the marker and then the state uh, pro people will work with us to make sure that it's accurate and so on. So um, really what we're hoping from you is that you will, if you have any objections or suggestions, we'd certainly love to hear them. Um, and um, otherwise, kind of give your blessing to this project. Um, it doesn't have to be approved by you particularly, but we'd like, uh, the state wants to know that you're aware of it and you're not, you don't have any problems with it, I guess. <clears throat> Thanks, Leslie. I have a question. Um, <laughs> I was just wondering, so I, I just want to make sure I understand that this is the first step um, in in a few in order to get this named uh, preservation site and then also to hopefully um, bring the site up to or repair the site in a, in a meaningful way. That's exactly right. And I did make a mistake in my letter. I said um, it would be, we're trying to get it to be a national historic site. It would be a state historic site. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, state um, through the Vermont Historic Preservation Office. We obviously, yes, um, my brother and I and my family are going to clean that. We've gotten permission to clean the, the saplings from around the building. So we're going to do that. Um, the rest of the maintenance, the repair of the floor and so on would take some funding. So we would have to apply for grants. And I don't know even yet what the process is we'd have to go through to get it declared um, a Vermont historic site. But that's our goal. Um, uh, with the local historical society, the local historic commission, and we have all the approvals that we need from everybody, um, and we waiting on your on your group now. And then the other thing, and I and I apologize if you don't know this, but I assume that the historic roadside marker program coordinates with like our Department of Public Works or with CTRAN, depending on where the sign is located. Yes, we submitted um, information about that. We, we looked at a site, we looked at their criteria, we, and we're suggesting a site just inside the guardrail on the um, left side of the road as you're heading toward Barnard. Um, so it would be on the state road right of way, Route 12, I think that is. And, but the state historic marker program coordinates with the local, um, people to make sure that that's an appropriate site and also it coordinates with them to install it. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Any other questions? For a motion? I would move we support the endeavor. Do a second? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And I'll just ask you to go to our zoning department to make sure the sign does not have to go through any committees, just so we're sure of that as well. Thank you. And will I be able to get a copy of the minutes or some thing that I can send in with the application, I guess? Yeah, well, we'll uh, Nikki, we'll be able to send you the minutes when they're completed. Um, so you can send you the draft minutes in a few days. The official minutes won't be ready for another month or so. Um, but she'll also um, send you the contact information for the planning and zoning department. 
Uh, so you can talk to them too about the sign. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Self stock and update. Yeah, so we had um, four students from Vermont State University Randolph come out to the Southwood Stock plant and they took a lot of photos well, they were with their professor. Um, they're in like the design engineer um, major and they are, I think, almost ready. They're going to come the beginning of April to the working committee and they'll have a model and all sorts of schematics and um, give us their ideas of how to make it look a little better. And we did um, give them kind of a, a fairly low budget <laughs> of what we thought we could spend on the project, knowing that we would probably need to um, fundraise money in addition to the ARPA money we've been given. So hopefully in May, we'll have some ideas and our next step would be to have um, it presented at a, at a public hearing so other people could, could look at, the very, at several ideas and give us feedback. Great. Thank Anything, you. Did I get that all, Greg? Greg's also on the meeting. <laughs> okay. Um, scheduling future meetings. Yeah. Uh, so I sent an email to both boards uh, end of last week. Um, we have a few necessary meetings we need to uh, attend to, uh, which are the short-term rental ones, uh, as mentioned before, one, first one's next week. Um, the second one we've talked about potentially doing April 18th. Um, as a week afterwards is to start our Passover. Uh, we want to avoid uh, having any meetings on a holiday. Um, that means we can talk about scheduling on that end. Uh, but besides those two, there will also be the standard uh, trustees meeting and the select board meeting. Um, I also am recommending um, at least three joint meetings as well. Um, those meetings would cover kind of um, an analysis of, of me on the kind of Woodstock and what I've seen over the last year and my uh, recommendations going forward. Um, the personnel policy presentation by myself and, and Nikki. Um, and then uh, the start of the both boards kind of having a conversation about what goals they want for the boards, but also for the department heads, for myself and for um, the committees that report to the boards. Um, the second meeting would consist of department heads um, and the committee commissions coming to the boards, talking about their goals for the departments and the committees, um, their challenges, the things they want to see going forward. Um, it would also include a personnel policy discussion by the boards, um, and then a continuation of uh, the conversation about goals overall. Um, the third meeting, ideally the last meeting, would be kind of review on everything that happened in the previous meetings. Um, and then a vote on the personal policy, personnel policy, um, and then a vote and discussion on the goals that will trickle down from the boards to myself, the department heads, to their staff, and then to the committees and commissions that report to the boards. Um, so I know that's a lot of stuff to put into April and May with everything we have going on, um, but I feel it's important to kind of get this conversation going and also completed so the personnel policy could go in effect July 1, um, and also department heads committees can then realign their work for July 1 for the goals that the board set out for them. Um, so we can be flexible. I know my email is very optimistic of having four meetings once once every week. Mm -hmm. um, but I think as long as if we maybe plan at least the first one, um, that probably will get the ball rolling and I can confirm with um Actually, so instead of backing up, I think that the both chairs uh, and myself can kind of get a tentative schedule. Uh, but I want to see if the select board has any comments on how this is laid out. Uh, if you'd like to see any changes um, or anything uh, included or taken away or overall uh, feedback on it. Well, I, I wouldn't mind getting one or two of the joint meetings the same night as the either trustees or select board meetings. Okay. And just make whatever. Uh, whatever board has that meeting, a lighter agenda in case it won't play. Okay. Were you envisioning some of these being during the day, though, so that employees didn't have to? Yeah, it works both stay. ways. You know, employees don't have to come late at night, but then it may be hard to get representatives of the committees and commissions come during the day if they have full time jobs. 
So I think either way, it's gonna be in a perfect system. Um, but also, I think there are some departments that the goals are, could be rather straightforward and may not necessitate a five hour meeting. You know, the fire and police are pretty straightforward. We may want to push in that direction, but you know, end of the day, if there's a fire going on, the fire department has to fill put it out. Um, so I think some of those could even be a memo from the department heads if they don't feel it necessary to be, you know, in front of the boards. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions on that? Okay. Bond Street. Um, so based on, um, you can do the podium too if you want. That's, there's a microphone at the podium. Oh, it depends on what you're oh yeah. It's probably easier to sit down. <laughs> Um, so based on the guidance from uh, the board, myself, uh, Chief Green, uh, our hunter, uh, went out to the sites uh, last week. Um, C and Bauer couldn't join up, so we talked to them afterwards. Um, no one had any issues with the way the plans were currently designed. Um, I have reached out to the bank on the corner there. I told them, no, this potentially could be happening. Um, at the time, they had no um, current feedback. Um, but there was no real issue, I think, with public works or fire um, with any changes that are being requested currently. Um, they had other recommendations uh, that we can get into if the board wants to, but um, in essence, they, they were okay with the, the plans. So what were their other recommendations? Yeah. Um, one recommendation was to turn Bond Street on, into a one-way um, to uh, minimize some of the traffic and issues. Uh, another idea was to ex just extend the sidewalk across Bond Street and turn Bond Street into a private road, um, and then all their repairs and maintenance would go uh, onto the landowners. Um, so those are two ideas that people were talking about as we kind of talked about it, um, but those might be larger conversations besides what the plans are. I'm not in favor of Bond Street being one way. I'm not in favor of giving it up to a private road. Those no. <laughs> um, but there's no problem with two way traffic. No, they're out there and um, they don't think it'll be um, a, a concern. How wide the road going to be? So it's broader than a half? I think it was uh, 1.25 rods. A rod and a quarter. And that makes it wider than it is now. Or, it, it, so and you are. I'm Andrew Garthwaite. I'm the architect working with the Duckworth. Clay, maybe. There are there. There aren't yet. Yes. We're on. Good morning, you all. Oh, and Molly. There yeah. they are. So it's um, going to be a 20 foot walk, 20 foot road. I'm not sure. It's, a, it's actually, sir, it's 20 foot, seven and a half inches, of <laughs> which 16 and a half feet is, uh, is going to be the walk. driving surface between the curbs. that the same as it is now? It is essentially the same. There is a plan that shows um, it's the, the regularizing what's there, um, basically. It's pretty much what's there. What's there right now, actually, the pavement is, um, over time, it's sort of the pavement has grown, and there's been a sort of a white stripe that's marked the, um, Sidewalk, and this is proposing put a curb sort of close to that line and create actual sidewalk. You know, people park there. Um, I guess they're not supposed to, but yeah. people do park there and uh, ob obstruct that. It's because there's the pavement is actually level, the only sidewalk that's marked by this white line. I don't know how well y'all can see what I'm sharing on the screen, but uh, this is what we proposed a month ago, and you can kind of see, if I zoom in, you can see the existing road is in, is in gray, and then the red shows the new stone curbs that we're proposing. So you can see that the, the overall width is very comparable to what uh, we currently have. It does shift a little bit towards number three bond. Uh, but the width itself is quite comparable. And of course, you have you have a, a portion where you have a uh, a walking area. So you can see here in this other. These are existing conditions. You can see 16 foot, 15.9. So this is between the white stripe, which is indicated as the pedestrian area. 
uh, we're proposing a 16.5 width. So 16.5 is about the same as what most of the road is. It does flare out a little bit wider in this portion, uh, but generally speaking, it's about as wide as most of the road is. Um, so we're we're proposing one rod for the for the width, which is fairly consistent, and then the addition of the sidewalk and then the stone curbs. And we can fit all of that within the one and a quarter rod. But you can see here, even, even with the bank, uh, it really, I, I want to pay particular attention to the, to the bank's property since that's not property that we own. And you can see that the curb just really generally aligns with what's, what's there now with edge of asphalt. You can see the edge sort of wobbling around a little bit. Yeah, and then the other end of the road is actually we're losing. Yeah. Um, we're losing here. Then. You're losing on well, one side and gaining on the other. A little bit on the yeah. other. Yeah. Overall, we're losing more than we're gaining by the look. Yeah, and and what happens for large trucks? Well, uh, on the road. Now there's areas to pull over. I, so, so what I would say is, in terms of large trucks, the what they're doing now is kind of they have the ability to kind of uh, drive up on the pedestrian area, which is not ideal. So, in some ways, it you know it the curbs would make it where people are not pulling off in the mud and off the side of the asphalt. They're not uh, you know running over pedestrians and pulling up on those those areas. So, it, it really clearly defines the the driving surface. Uh, but but again, I think it aligns with generally speaking with what with what is there now. So sixteen point five, whereas you know these are lesser dimensions here. Yes, it is a little bit more down here. But but really, what our challenge was is it's you know that the two homes are so close together, and just making it you know going to the one and a half rods puts the you know puts the edge of the the curve way up here. Uh, so close to number three bond. It's just, it's something that we're hoping to avoid. So I, I, I think that it's generally speaking, just with the addition of the sidewalk, the curbs, more safe for pedestrians, the idea that we had put uh, crosswalks to align with the sidewalk on Pleasant Street and Central Street, I, I just think it's a, a big improvement. Um, but just, but absolutely open to y'all's feedback. And, and if, if y'all have any additional thoughts, I think, like Eric said, I think he met with Mark Hunter and David Green, and they were generally supportive of the plan. And I think that was kind of the the takeaway from our last meeting is to get everyone's input. I don't like giving up any road, <laughs> um, even though it's 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 a more on one end you're taken away from the other where somebody can kind of give and take if they need someone they can wait for someone to come across that's my opinion well and and, and again on this if we take this end as an example i think like andrew is trying to articulate i don't think i don't think we're it is a slight shift and part of that is but it's not really a giving up if we look at this end in particular um the area that I guess would be given up here on this side, on the west side of the street, would be between the red line and the gray line. But then the area of the road that would be added on the east side of the street is also between the red line and the gray line. You can see that the surface area of, of the two are pretty comparable. Um, you know, if anything, maybe we're adding a little bit more road uh, because this is what's being added on this side. So, so I don't necessarily think that we're giving up there. And, and, you know, we're absolutely open if y'all feel like we need to tweak this, you know, these radii, the radius dimension to make it, you know, what the surveyor did is he just showed what he thought was mo most representative of what's there in terms of the curves. These radius, these radii could be made larger, uh, but I don't know how beneficial that would be or how necessary that is. Right. I'm talking the other end of the street. Other end of the street, other end of the street, uh, it does. And, and, that, and that's another conversation on this end of the street. Um, you know, we were totally open and I asked the surveyor this, would it be unusual to, you know, to make the road wider in one stretch of the road and narrower in another stretch? Because it, 
Okay. Because, you know, over here, we're less sensitive because it's not between the two structures. The structures can't be relocated. Uh, you know, and this is yard and but he, he said it would be highly, highly unusual to have the road exist as one width and then kind of funnel our neck down to a narrower width. And um, but it does again, now. <laughs> we're, what's that? But it does now. That's what it does now. I know. And, and yeah. but he said in terms of getting kind of a, a proper survey and getting it in the meeting minutes and kind of recording this for the future and, and plus just kind of good building practice when you're setting your curbs and doing everything else that it would be you know that it would he said it would be unusual and, and we're not necessarily opposed to that he just said it would be unusual and and i think what we're struggling with is again this this dotted line uh goes to one and a half rods and, and it just and i feel like it's really not th this plan this survey doesn't represent just how close the road would be to the front facade of this structure um it's literally when you walk off the steps off your porch and there's the road it's just so close and that, that's what we were trying to avoid. We, we kind of worked with this a fair amount and tried to massage it to get it where we thought it would be appropriate for, you know, for, for the village and for these two properties and future owners and pedestrians on the sidewalk. We just, we thought it was a pretty good, a pretty good compromise. Yep. And I work that you're adding on. Uh, on number four, yes, that's okay. good. Sorry. Right. There, there are old photographs that show yeah, the porch yeah. there, yeah. yeah. I will add, Mark Hunter also uh, was talking about maybe adding a crosswalk from that sidewalk across Pleasant Street as well to kind of help stem some of the traffic and making it an easier walk from Bond Street with the new sidewalk all the way across. And they were all fine with losing road on, with the road on one end? They didn't give me any objections at the time. I'm still concerned about trucks and a car. I would rather see the sidewalk that's up on the Central Street side pushed over more so if they met, they have some place to pass each other. Well, I agree. <laughs> yeah, I guess, you know, it kind of goes back to, in my opinion, just, you know, what we want. Well, I guess, first of all, like, you know, a, a trailer, for example, is uh, usually you know, I think seven foot six wide, uh, the widest of commercial trailers are eight foot wide. So even if you do have a truck that's, you know, a truck doesn't exceed eight foot in width. And if you have a truck and a small car, we do have 16 and a half feet of driving surface. So if a small car is maybe six and a half feet and the truck is eight feet, um, you know, I, I do think it's doable. Um, you know, you need special kind of wide wide permits to go wider than eight foot for any kind of so, so it's, it would be unusual to have trucks wider than eight feet not counting mirrors and things of that nature trailers are eight six and and obviously you haven't seen a tourist drive up here yet <laughs> <laughs> and, and i i one thing and i don't know if he'll want to hop on um but we actually have engineers on this meeting for a different department and they just emailed me a question so john are you on John from Hill Tanner, are you there? Coming in. Um, there yeah, can go. you guys just uh, ask a question with drainage? You uh, emailed me. Yeah, yeah. I was just pointing out, you know, so when you curb both sides of the street, uh, that will force the drainage onto the street. I assume it sheets off right now. So there would need to be a collection system. Um, and I'm not sure what that would tie into within the network. Or, and it could bring into some new uh, stormwater. Um, half acre permitting requirements. It's not it's not unmanageable. I was just pointing it out to Eric on the side that that would be something to think about. And you may want to consider widening it. it. It's 16 feet curb to curb. So yes, when you have just pavement and the truck can let its wheel go right to the edge, it's different than when trying to get to the face of the curb is pretty tight at 16 feet for passing vehicles. Right. So, so John, I, um, we, we do have the surveyor is a civil engineer, a, guy, a gentleman named Brad Rutterman. Uh, and then we have DeWolf Engineering, uh, Chris Temple, who's a civil engineer. And what we talked about is rather than like any kind of gutter system, kind of as we regrade Bond Street, trying to, you know, right now it currently does have a high point, but there are low spots. But really trying to be mindful, we set those curbs and try and have fall both towards Central and Pleasant. 
where you don't have any ponding of water, but uh, but I don't know that it'd necessarily be necessary to add any kind of gutter or piping or drainage per se, but just really trying to improve the the slope of the existing street. Uh, and it is 16 foot six is what we're proposing. So a little bit wider than 16. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, you know, I was pointing out, you know, it is conceptual what you have right now. Uh, it's in general, like from a complete streets, from a multi-user of within a right-of-way, the idea of getting protected sidewalks where vehicles are currently traveling into the pedestrian areas, it's a good concept. Uh, it is something that, of a goal of, engineers in the state of Vermont with complete streets, just bringing up that through the preliminary design, you're, and that's a good engineering firm to work through, you know, through those, through those challenges. And it, it can evolve a bit from the concept to what you need in the, in the final presentation. Right. Absolutely. Thanks, John. Wendy and Bill. Yeah. I, I, I guess, I guess the last thing I might say, oh, I'm sorry. Wendy, who, is the, who had the hand up first? Thank you. Um, thank you. I, I want to applaud um, the new property owner's commitment to uh, pedestrian life, to upgrading a historical site. I'm speaking as a village resident. I'm also speaking as um, a member of the Village Historic Preservation commission where things that nod to how Woodstock has evolved are positives. I would suggest we rank and prioritize what, what we value most in this. Um, really trucks being for that cut through, I would think rated lower need than the benefits of the pedestrian and really truly historic aesthetic experience that's added value you can't measure the trucks i'm thinking of i mean a fire truck an ambulance the most important would find their way um as far as casella they can pick up off of pleasant um you know i'm just not sure what trucks we were prioritizing for in this dialogue if we weigh it in the whole scheme of of the benefits the village stands to um, experience as a pedestrian, as a visitor. Um, so I, I just wanted to weigh in on that level. Thank you. Okay. Jill. So Wendy said most of what I was going to say, um, this is a walking village. Bond Street is not a road for trucks except the emergency ones. Um, there's a very simple way to do this, which is put a sign that says no trucks. And, and make this a road that we use every day to walk into the village, to go home, and just let's, let's build the village for walkers. I'm supportive of of this plan. Um, I think, you know, having more sidewalk is beneficial to us. Um, and so I thank the deaf first for proposing this. Um, I think this is like Harry said, a vast improvement over what we currently have. And if our emergency services can get through, then yeah. I, I do understand the concern for other traffic, but I do think the question needs to be posed by a planning commission head on you know, what we do want to plan for. And I would like to plan for more safer uh, pedestrians. So I think there's, there's two things to consider here. One is the board approving this plan as presented uh, with the assumption that I have to go through planning and zoning and all that okay. stuff. Um, so that's one decision. The other one is probably a long-term decision is who's gonna pay for this work. Um, and those can be two separate conversations, two separate votes, but uh, I think just be clear that this is going to be expensive. Um, and so who's going to be paying for that should also be a conversation that happens either, if not now, um, in the near future. So has there been any thought as to run off where that goes? Now it kind of drifts off, but when you channel it on each side with a curb. Right, I would say um, at least half the street, the, the buildings are the 
grade rises up, so um, it doesn't wash off. And even the, the southern end, I'm not quite as familiar with, but I don't think there's that much that's running off the street right now. And, you know, it's just sort of shedding off. To... Right, but it's going to go somewhere. I mean, right. I, so I would, right now, it's... I would entertain a motion that we approve this pending a drainage Storm water. Storm water plan. I'll make that motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 The, the last comment I was going to make is I think what we're trying to do is just is get the width of the road approved. I think that, and I might be mistaken in terms of just uh, in terms of process, but but I think we're trying to get the width of the road approved, and then I think there's numerous additional approvals beyond that. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So I don't I don't know if the if the environment if the drainage and kind of the engineering and technical details would come as part of a different board, um, but. I think the width is kind of the, the question before this board, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, you're correct. And there'll also be a lot of permits you'll have to get. And some of those conversations will happen in the permitting process. Uh, what's going to happen in the drainage will be one of them when you do a sidewalk permit, uh, excavation, parking lot permit, et cetera, et cetera. So those, those all should come up in that process as well. But, but just to be clear, we want to, under, we want to understand the drainage, the environmental, before we kind of approve the width. Is that right? We have approved the width. Yeah, we approve the width with conditional. conditional making sure the drainage is not going to is going to work by shedding it to both central and pleasant street okay and y'all would that be would y'all like for for one of our consultants to examine that and get back to you all yeah, yeah that'd yeah. be great yeah okay all right and then that can just be a conversation between them and mark hunter um our public works director as long as he's happy with it yeah Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. So we want to move on to the agenda policy quickly, and then we do uh, the other additions and deletions. So we can do um, the agenda policy, and then local options, sewer, and we also have two rivers sitting Yeah, that we had them last, so they could also stay for the conversation about um, the yeah. water plants. Okay. Um, so the agenda policy is just a reminder. Um, the board and the trustees voted on this back in the winter uh, to kind of follow a, a new process, a codify the process we've kind of been following for um, agendas and how it's going to be laid out. Um, this is a way we're hoping to be as community as possible to the board members, but also to have some kind of guidelines in place so the public knows uh, how to get an agenda, what's needed, um, and um, because it's always voted on, it's not a vote, um, it's a discussion, uh, but I talked to the trustees and I will stress this to the, the board as well. Um, Nikki and myself will be the bad guys, uh, telling people you know, that they not following the process, they can't be on the agenda. Uh, and we just ask that the board supports that. So if someone comes to you afterwards and says, Eric's being mean, and I won't put this on the agenda. Um, you can say, no, the, the board voted on this process. They're just following the process that we put in place. Um, and so I'll just ask that uh, Nikki will have this. We'll put it on the listserv, Facebook, our website, and we're also going to put it on where you go on a website to get permits. There'll be a link to have the agenda process there as well, so people can also see on the websites. Uh, so it should be hopefully as well known as possible. Is Joe here for the police chief report? Yes. Nothing else to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Joe, uh, Chief, you want to come up and. Um, so um, again, we, we kind of fell off this, but uh, when Chief Swanson was going through the process of interviewing for the police chief's job, uh, one of his ideas in front of the select board for, uh, to give an update, but also to uh, get feedback from the board as well to kind of uh, make it as transparent as possible, uh, the relationship we have with the village uh, police department. So thanks, Chief. So starting off with some, the personnel, um, can't think of what the date was I was here last, so I think it was a while ago. So since then, I've had uh, hired a sergeant, and that's Chris O'Keefe, and he comes to us from Vermont DMV and before that, Hartford Police Department. So he's got uh, 15 or 16 years of law enforcement with a good background that lends itself to Woodstock well. 
Um, Corporal Murphy is coming back next week from her maternity leave. Um, so she's excited to have some more interaction with other than the four walls of her living room. <laughs> um, Officer Turco has started her level three training, which is 16 weeks long and will at the end qualify her to investigate more crimes. And um, she's doing well, she's enjoying it. And then Officer Aurora has started his, he started his training in September. And at the beginning of March, he finishes his training. So he's now out on his own. Um, we have been pretty busy and just in the first quarter of the year, we've made uh, 13 arrests. We had one scare at the school that um, took about a day of investigating to and um, joining it with um, other resources with mental health and um, to make sure that everything was safe at the school to reopen later in the, uh, in the week. Um, we started tracking directed patrols. I don't have the numbers on me, um, but looking at the trending where, you know, December was like a partial month. It was people getting used to it. January um, started out strong and then um, kind of tapered off a little bit in what we're recording, not in what we're doing. And then January was pretty consistent. Um, and it's a good way to look at trends and where we're patrolling it more than um, every road that we're driving on. Because if we started doing that, it would just be uh, a flood of meaningless road names. And if I could just interject here, this uh, conversation came up as the chairs of both boards are talking about a new contracts for the police department. Um, and the contract that got approved last month uh, lays out this kind of tracking of police patrols in the town. Um, so they started doing it in December to kind of get the officers used to it. Uh, it's not currently an obligation, but they're doing it now to kind of track, see how it goes over the course of the year. Um, but once July hits, it'll be an obligation for them to kind of track where they are. Um, because as we know, if you're visible in the village, it's usually pretty easy because you're probably somewhere in the village where everyone is. When you're on a dirt road um, or someone in the town, you could be there, but no one's gonna see you because five people live there or no one's driving by. Um, so it's a way for it to make sure that they, the town has the coverage that they are, they're paying for. Sorry, Chief. Thank you. I've got the um, the new graphics on the Town Explorer. Uh, some of the blue lights on that car have burned out, I think, just from water exposure. So I've purchased some new ones, and I'll be getting those installed at some point in the next month or whenever I get that scheduled. Um, and I have... Um, at about the end of the year, about, I think, seven officers now total are certified in uh, tasers, which I think is a great um, additional non-lethal force option um, that can be used in 10 situations. Uh, that's kind of all I prepared for this morning. I don't know what questions everyone has for me, but I, happy to field anything. I would be remiss if I didn't say that the residents of Southwood Stock Village are still speeding going on through the village. Okay. Um, I had a question, Joe, just because I'm not super familiar with the, all the staff on the police force, but I was wondering how many officers or how many staff members uh, live in Woodstock versus like the surrounding areas, like how long people are commuting. Um, there's two of us that live in town. Mm -hmm. And then um, other commutes range from 20 to 35 minutes. If I could just hop in on that, this is something we're going to be talking about in those meetings. Um, you know, it's one thing for me to have to drive 30 minutes, but when you're talking about public safety, yeah. um, 30 minutes can be the difference between life and death. Um, so for EMTs, fire, police, um, and it just kind of goes to the issue we're having with what we're paying people compared to the cost of living in Woodstock and around Woodstock and how that is can be detrimental to the services we do provide. Um, so Phil, I'll, I'll put a plug in for that because you'll hear that more often as we go forward. Um, I know it's not a simple solution, but it's something we need to be aware of going forward of how this is going to have an impact on us. 
Do you have officers looking to relocate to Woodstock? I have one officer that um, will be looking in June okay. or so. Um, I, I will add, I did bring in um, Officer Donka, who is one of our part-time officers, to do a specific day in Southwest I think about four hours or so directly and um, focused in Southwest Stock. That was last week. Uh, last thing I want to thank um, Chief Swanson and the Sheriff's Office. We had a scare uh, last week uh, in Route 4. Um, and they both responded very quickly to uh, solve the issue as quickly as possible. So I just want to thank the public for how quickly they all responded and the work they did. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Have a nice day, everyone. Thanks, Joe. Um, so next, if we don't mind, I'd like to go to our short-term rental updates. Um, so Clara Powell, um, who is a board member, uh, newly, newly re-elected, re uh, is also the ex-officio for the Planning Commission. Uh, as we talked before, state statute uh, gives the select board the ability to have or recommends or requires um, that a board member be an ex officio for the planning commission. The planning commission traditionally is a commission that uh, provides legislative advice to the board. So having someone on the board who are in those meetings on the Senate can then report back to the board is very important. Um, so with everything we have going on, I thought it'd be nice to have a pause for a second and let Laura kind of inform the board and the public uh what is on tap thank you um yeah i'm sure you guys have started to see some of the conversation so i'll just give an overview of what is happening and what has happened um the planning commission is having their public hearing on monday to hear final public comment about the process that they've been working on for uh, a year to review our current short-term rental rate uh short-term rental uh ordinances um Currently, we have a separate ordinance for the town and separate uh, separate ordinance for the village. Um, and then we are going to have an informational meeting with both boards next Wednesday, the 27th, which will be to give everybody an overview of what's gone into that process, what the proposed uh, uh, regulations are going to be, and then in preparation for a vote in April with both boards as well. Um, so I certainly don't expect you guys to have all the information because that will be coming on Wednesday. But if you have questions leading up to, or if you've heard from residents with questions, I'm happy to sit down with you. I know Steven's happy to sit down with you. Um, this process has taken, I would say, at least hundreds of hours on the part of the Planning Commission. Um, and they've heard from all sorts of groups um, within the community and from the state level, um, including but not limiting to housing advocates, um, people who have been displaced by short-term rentals, um, people who advocate for short-term rentals at the state level, short-term rental operators, property management companies, um, and community members from both the town and the village. So I would just say, yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be comprehensive. It's going to be uh, very dense, but we're going to try and make it as uh, simple as possible so that everyone's on the same page in terms of understanding what's in front of them. And when will this go public? Which part? The ordinance, the new ordinance. The proposed ordinance. The proposed ordinance, the proposed ordinance yes. will be public on the at the public hearing on Monday. Is um, that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah. So they'll they'll go right. Tuesday. They'll be available to they'll, they'll either on listserv or online or something. Yes. Do you want to speak to this, Stephen? Look, I didn't expect to be here uh, this morning. Um, uh, Stephen Bauer, Director of Planning. They're live already, Ray. Um, they're, they are online. They live online. Um, okay. As the Planning Commission will be presenting them for public hearing on Monday. Um, as they as they change, as they, you know, we'll, we'll try and get those updated as fast as we can as they change through the process. I'd like to see it on listserv on yeah. Tuesday, please. Yeah, we can put that, we can put that link up there. I'd rather have them come with questions than. So you want it before yeah. Tuesday? You want yeah. it before Monday? No, I want it before the meeting. The so meeting Monday. Wednesday. I'm meeting Wednesday. Yeah, our meeting. Yep. So if they get, they're having a final meeting Monday night. Mm -hmm. So if they get out Tuesday morning. Yep. On Monday night, so it's on the list for Tuesday morning. Yep. So what our plan would be is to have a link to the specific language of the entire ordinance. I mean, it's about 16 pages, um, double spaced. And so that. That, that's a legal document, so 
uh, I don't want to just have that, you know, and just copy and paste that on the listserv. Uh, what we plan to have is a summary of what is there, as well as an FAQ, frequently asked questions. Um, so if people don't have time to read the entire ordinance, um, otherwise, if people have time, we'll have the link there. You can see the full language if you want to dive fully in, but we'll have a summary and the, and the, well, the FAQ. Final list of the people can go to. So gotcha. Like All right, we'll send that out. Thank you. Thanks. We did the sign. Are there any other questions on the short term rental updates? No. Uh, Laura, do you want to hop into the 1% then? Yeah. Sorry. I'll just say um, so I wanted to follow up to the local options tax, which passed obviously on town meeting day. Um, and uh, we followed up with the Department of Taxes to confirm that. Um, that we want this to be in effect starting on July 1st. So what's going to happen next is that the Department of Taxes is going to send notices to all residents and um, businesses in Woodstock and the surrounding communities, as well as e-commerce retailers. Um, those should go out mid-May, so like 45 days notice. And then uh, the Department of Taxes will update their um, online map, which is called their like tax locator. Um, and then after that, um, we will start collecting or the tax will start being remitted to us after the first quarterly filing, which would be September 30th. So we can expect to see um, funds come the first week of November of this year. Thank you. Yeah. Questions? Okay. Uh, last thing we have before we get to um, Harry and then um, the wastewater plant. Uh, we talked in the past about having some kind of guidelines for sewer abatements. Uh, so Susan Gabor took some time, kind of put something together that was emailed to you, uh, I believe, last week. Uh, we looked at it internally. Um, we do have a, a comment on number four that we can get into. Um, but I think that the goal was, if we have this uh, as a guideline, um, then a if people when people come to Corey or Nikki or myself. We can say it does not fit into one of these regulations. Uh, you're not going to get approved. You're still welcome to go to the select board, but odds are it's not going to be approved. Uh, but then if someone does come in from the board, the board has guidelines to fall back on instead of um, kind of being at the will of uh, the board at the time. Um, so I think it's important to start the discussion now um, and hopefully have something ready for June. Um, so I'll dive right in. Um, the one issue we had with number four um, is we really don't have a, a, a process internally to track like those three years when it will go back. Um, we could probably have an Excel sheet that would require some more uh, work hours, um, but that's something we just kind of caught right off the bat as we talked about internally. Uh, so I'll just flag that as we go forward and maybe we can try to find a different solution to that or uh, come up with a way we can do it uh, over the next month or so. And I, I don't think this was available online, so maybe we could just review what number four is since people on Zoom don't know what we're talking about. Oh, yeah. Um, and I wonder if I can share my screen quickly. Um, the so concern was the people that come to us and say, there's like, we had one today. It, we're not a family home anymore. We're only a two person home. They're not on water, so we can't measure or they're not metered at least and so we have no way of knowing when that home goes back to being a three or four person home and they should be contributing more toward the sewer so what i had drafted was to say that in three years it automatically reverts back to its prior use unless they come in and ask us again just to try to catch some of that but and eric saying that there's no way right for us in the track to track those abatements yeah I wonder if this is somewhere with a twenty thousand dollar ARPA fund could <laughs> so far. Yeah. Maybe Corey has an idea. It could be. Could be. Um, and I think you know this is a different conversation, but I, I know since I've been here, we've talked about two revisiting how we do non-metered sewer rates. Say this is why I think it should be based on number of bedrooms. Um, and so that's uh, another conversation we probably have to have in conjunction with this is how we want to do that. Um, I think what my recommendation would be to find a way to encourage people to install a meter 
Uh, so what we could do to kind of have the flat rate at a certain amount to encourage installing a meter so they have a more accurate cost structure. There would be less work for us, less work for them, and more accurate understanding how much they use. But if you're not on the aqueduct, I think you can put it. I'm just, I don't know why you wouldn't be able to. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how expensive it is, but it's going to save you. It's going to save you money. Just, you know, it's an accurate way of keeping track of it, unless you go back to the bedroom. And this is what the, the original guidelines we have right now are. Um, so if the board wants to kind of look this over, and maybe it can be on the agenda for next month. And we can make some changes or additions if we want. Um, yeah, I think I'm willing to wait till next month. Yeah, I mean, I think we should have, have a discussion about it a few times and go over some issues. I think that's everything except for a note. Yep. So, Harry, come on up. I want to first of all, I want to thank him for sitting through the last hour and 15 minutes. Uh, we originally had him um, up top to kind of let him come and go, but then when we had Hoyle Tanner, we wanted uh, Harry to be available to ask any questions when it relates to energy um, and how the town can work with Hoyle Tanner uh, going forward. So that's why we asked him to wait till the end. So I appreciate it. Great. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Yeah. So. First of all, I'll say uh, thank you to Mr. Chairman and Eric and for the rest of the select board for having me here this morning. Um, and I got to say, I've been to like 18 or 20 different select boards in the region now. This is the first one I've been to with a podium. So I feel like I've really hit the big time here. <laughs> um, so yeah, as Eric said, my name is Harry Faulkner. I'm the new energy coordinator from the Two Rivers Ottaquichi Regional Commission. I work for Woodstock and the five other towns that participate in the IREC program, the Intermunicipal Inter Regional Energy Coordinator Program. Um, I just took over in late January, so still pretty new to it, um, but it was a very smooth transition between me and the previous uh, energy coordinator, Jeff Kraut, because I already worked at Two Rivers as a sort of general purpose planner for the last year um, with some experience in uh, energy projects. So it's been a pretty uh, smooth transition. I was able to work with Jeff uh, for the last, alongside Jeff for the last two weeks or, or so and have uh, joint meetings with him. and. Eric and some of the other town managers uh, in the program to really ensure uh, continuity between us. So, yeah, the main reason of me being here this morning is just to introduce myself and get some face time with you, but also to um, briefly talk about what has been done so far under my very short tenure and talk about what your um, priorities are going forward for, for me and for um, energy projects that you're interested in in town. Um, so just very briefly, without monopolizing too much time before we uh, speak to the folks at Oil Tanner about the wastewater project, um, the big thing that has happened uh, since I started is that uh, the school district has taken delivery of three electric school buses from the EPA uh, Clean School Bus uh, Program, which is a $1.1 million grant that was won by uh, Jeff Martin, who was the previous uh, energy coordinator a few years ago. So that has finally come to fruition um, after you know numerous delays. So. Um, you may have seen Ginevra's piece in the standard about it, um, but yeah, the school district has those three buses on site now. Uh, and as, as of a couple of weeks ago, when we got uh, a sort of meet and greet with the buses and the and the, the vendor from uh, from the uh, manufacturer, um, they are still waiting on getting their charging infrastructure installed, but um, everything else is uh, being finalized. So uh, a long process there, but that has finally um, come to fruition. So. Um, the other thing that we are looking at very soon is the Municipal Energy Resilience Program uh, energy audit of this building, Town Hall, uh, which is coming up next month. Uh, we still have some back and forth between myself and Eric and the, uh, the contractor there to finalize a, a date and time for that, just to make sure that we're out of folks' hair here and we're not interrupting any um, public access needs and things like that. So that's coming up soon for a building of this size. They estimate that the energy audit is worth about $20,000 and that is being provided for free through this program. Um, other smaller things, um, the EEI um, energy upgrades for your various town buildings, um, that project was already in process when I took over and I understand there's been some rockiness with uh, communication uh, to the town from uh, EEI. So. I have been trying to take some of the coordination uh, for uh, vendor or for contractor access off of Eric's place. So 
mainly with the uh, coordinating with um, the Chamber of Commerce to get into the Welcome Center when the, they need to. Um, so hopefully that that has been going a little bit smoother, at least for the Welcome Center. And but um, you know some minor communication snafus have have continued with them. So really just trying to be in the contractor's ear there and uh, help make sure that we don't we minimize uh, you know conflicts going forward. Uh, and then lastly, again, in my very short tenure so far, uh, we've started working with uh, local businesses a little bit. So um, we uh, were looking for sites uh, in town for uh, the state's EVSE program, the Electric Vehicle Supply Equipment Program, uh, which is a big new grant program that uh, can help fund uh, EV fast chargers at uh, various, uh, they refer to them as public attractions, basically businesses and uh, places that generate um, traffic like that. Um, and so we we were looking to solicit sites and had some meetings and we ended up applying for uh, that grant for um, Leah Warner, who is the owner of the Woodstock side of the Bridgewater Mills. Um, 10,000 to 15,000 cars a day pass by that location uh, on their way to Killington. And obviously, you know, having an EV charger is a good um, amenity for local businesses to use to, you know, generate additional traffic and, and support their businesses and ultimately uh, support tourism to Woodstock. So. Um, we'll find out if we're invited to uh, submit a full application for that uh, by April 1st, so a couple weeks now. Um, that grant amount is for uh, up to $160,000 for that equipment. Um, looking to the future, so uh, big initiatives going forward. Uh, the main thing on my plate really is that Jill and the other folks from Sustainable Woodstock have uh, brought me into the planning effort for the wastewater treatment plant. So we organized a meeting with uh, Hoyle Tanner um, and uh, Efficiency Vermont's uh, commercial and industrial team to make sure that we keep them engaged throughout the design process to really look to um, maximize energy saving technology that is implemented in the plant. Obviously, it's a massive capital project. We want to make sure that the resulting plant is as energy efficient as possible and, and try to save on operations costs going forward, even though we are going to have to, town is going to have to pour a substantial amount of money into the capital project. Um, so we're looking at uh, various solutions with Supermont and Hoyle Tanner has been very receptive to working with them uh, for uh, reducing the plant's energy use and thus reducing operations costs going forward. So really just uh, keeping, my role is keeping Efficiency Vermont engaged uh, throughout the design process and making sure that they're uh, pursuing all of the various technologies that they, they can be um, to make sure that we get the best result. Um, and without going into the weeds too much on that, um, I'm sure uh, some more engineering uh, talk will be happening uh, in the rest of this meeting. But um, and yeah, so for for the rest of my piece, um, I would just ask you all on the select board what your other priorities are going forward for myself and for the program. Um, if there are other energy efforts in town that you are interested in in having me focus on, um, and. Yeah, my only other question would be how you would like to hear from me in the future, um, whether you would like to have me check in on some kind of regular basis in person at these meetings. Um, my normal reporting system to the steering committee uh, is to uh, provide written quarterly reports, which can, of course, can and will be passed on to uh, Nikki to be included in your packets and, and such going forward. But if you want more um, in-person check-ins from me, I'm, of course, very open to that. I work at the King Farm just up the road. so. No, no hassle for me whatsoever. Um, but yeah, so your priority projects and how you would like to hear from me in the future. So before the board, I just want to say one thing. Uh, when we talked about um, in the past, energy coordinator, uh, one of the things I mentioned was I want someone that was proactive, not reactive. Uh, and since Harry's come on board, he's been very proactive, uh, which is what, as we talked about a lot, there's not a lot of free time on our end to do things, to have those conversations, to have to have someone who's coming to me with ideas or solutions has been very helpful because it takes away that part of me spending time trying to find something and then reaching out to him. Um, so I just want to thank him for being so proactive, um, not only with EEI, uh, but with a few other things we've been working on as well. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm Harry. Thanks. Thanks for being here. Um, I will just say the, all those projects you're working on sound exciting, especially the EV chargers at the Woodstock side of the Bridgewater Mill. I think that's like a huge plus for us. Um, I wonder if it makes sense to have Harry back after we do our goals, that maybe we have kind of more direction for him 
Yeah, it's then, a great idea. Although I, I really encourage, I'm encouraged by all the proactive stuff he's done already. And if I could, I think it might, if we could invite him for that conversation, he would give the goals he thinks that he should be yeah. pursuing and the board can then come back and agree to disagree. So that might be a better way to phrase it. So we totally treat him as an employee. So if we want to treat him as a department head for energy, he can come back and, you know, um, so I don't know if you were here earlier, the boards are going to have kind of all the department heads committees mm -hmm. coming for, in front of them with their goals for the next fiscal year. Um, and then discuss them and then kind of go back to the department heads with the select board's goals for the department heads. Okay. Um, so if you want to participate in that process, uh, so kind of again, be proactive and tell us what you think we should be looking at and the board can see how that fits into the grand plan. Okay, absolutely. Anything else? That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you all. Yeah. All right, John and Christian, are you guys there? Yep. We're here. All right. So the floor is yours. Oh. <laughs> I thought we were here to answer questions. Uh, but would you like us to give uh, maybe the select board has something they wants to start off with, but given a background? Uh, can you kind of give a background on how the project have, has come along from the start um, and then what the final design will look like um, from your view? And uh, if you also want to mind giving kind of um, the background of South, South Woodstock that we talked about as well, uh, I think all those, all those three things would be very helpful. Kirsten, do you want to take a lead in going through the premise of design? Do you want me to pull up the PowerPoint presentation? Just yeah, so why don't we do that? Okay. Why don't we just, why don't we run through the PowerPoint again? And so quickly, before we start, I do want to, I, Kirsten, you and I said we weren't really going to get into this because we just, we just got notification that the congressionally directed spending has been announced and there could be some opportunities. It's really focused around energy. So uh, hearing uh, Harry talk and Harry, we should probably talk afterwards with Jill and, and Eric, but um, there could be some features that have been discussed in our previous meeting that that may be of interest. So we were doing some exploratory calls with Senator Welch having ties to your area. We thought that was a good fit to, to reach out to. So while we're we're just kind of like exploring for a number of clients, but uh, that came to mind, particularly with term, in terms of energy. So we'll come back to that afterwards. But sorry, I, I know we didn't say we weren't going to get into that, but it is something to keep on. That's it's exciting news. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah, some real strong dollar amounts that we could have potential for. All right, let me share over. I'll have the ability to share, right? Yeah, there's a green button. Yeah, just. Uh... All right. So just as a, um, I think let's go to the, just the timeline. Let's do a quick, go one slide up. Yeah. Just as a quick, we, um, the timeline, you know, your original facility was in 1968. Um, the, the, the Army Corps engineers built the uh, the berm around the treatment plant in 73. There's been upgrades throughout the years, um, but the majority of the plant is over, you know, it was built in 1982. Um, as I said, there has been a few additions and upgrades over the years, but the majority of the plant is showing its age and there is a need, and the equipment is at the end of its useful life. So there is a need to upgrade equipment so that you have a um, you have a properly operating plant that will meet your discharge effluent limits. So you do not violate them um, with your effluent out to the Ottaquichi River. And just as a backup, Hoyle Tanner was um, was retained by the town to do a preliminary engineering report, which is a assessment of all the existing conditions. We look at every piece of equipment on the, on the site. We give it a um, expected life um, rating and a criticality rating to determine, you know, what needs to be upgraded to, um, to bring you through the next 20 years. We look at a 20 year horizon for planning. And um, the results of that report have been shared with the with this um, select board. And it's basically we have aging infrastructure. There's a need for flood resiliency. Um, there is a need to upgrade for future permit limits. Um, the plant, you know, the, the plant has a nitrogen limit and will have a total phosphorus limit coming in the in the near future. Um, and to account for growth without um throughout your sewer shed 
Uh, one of the things we uh, we determined, we evaluated, is that the plan is seeing a lot higher peak uh, peak flows during rain events, and it's not rated for those peak flows. So there is the potential to overwhelm the system and not to have adequate treatment to meet your permit limitations or to disinfect prior to discharge to the Ottaquichi River. So our proposed site plan, as you can see, is to um, build a new headworks building um, right there, uh, upgrade the intermediate pumps for that peak hydraulic flow. Um, as you can see, the arrows coming through, build new aeration tanks with anoxic zones ahead of it. Um, that helps with our biological treatment process. Rehab the existing um, secondary clarifiers. Um, we would then demolish the existing aeration tank, which you can see hatched out. That's the large circle hatched out. We would demolish the existing chlorine contact tank and move to a new UV disinfection system housed in a building. Um, we would leave room once the, um, the existing aeration tank is demolished to have an addition put on to uh, the UV building. Sorry, just in the, if in the event you had a more stringent uh, total phosphorus limit, I have had conversations with the state of Vermont. It is expected that your limit will be around the 0.8 milligram per liter, which is easily achievable with just chemical addition. If in the future that is becomes more stringent, we would leave space so that you could do an upgrade at some point in the future for some kind of tertiary equipment like a filtration process. But that's not nece it's not necessary um, in the near future nor is it part of part of this proposed upgrade. Um, we'd also leave room once that tank is, the large aeration tank is demolished for future growth for a third uh, secondary clarifier. Again, not part of this upgrade, but we're leaving space for those things. Um, the large blue square at the top is an existing dewatering pump station, which is used to dewater the site in the event that the Ottaquichi River level is so high that it can't flow by gravity into it. It has been used on occasion, um, especially when there is a um, uh, an ice jam. It was used during Irene. It protects the plant from flooding. Those pumps are from the 70s and there's only one. So there's a need there to upgrade the upgrade that, provide a redundant pump, and then just upgrade that facility right there. Um, other areas are to have some renovations to the existing operations building. Um, the, the operators eat their lunch in their laboratory, which is not a sanitary condition. So that needs to be corrected. Energy efficiency um, upgrades, roof, windows, et cetera. I know some things have been happening all, all along, um, but we would look to uh, build off of those. Uh, the big uh, blue circles are the existing sludge holding tanks. We would be replacing the aeration equipment in those and providing more efficient blowers. The blowers for those are old and outdated and are not, and they're and they're a big energy consumption. Um, and that's that's it in a nutshell for the proposed site plan. And so just so we're clear. Um... Based on conversation we had in the past, you think there's about capacity for 500 more connections, Correct. Uh, and then you're also leaving space if Woodstock develops, especially in that area, that we could go back and increase the capacity for a sewer somewhere down the road. John, do you want to pull the site plan up again? Yes. Do you still have that, or it's, I, I it's actually? It's coming up. Just okay. Getting... So one of the nice things about these aeration tanks and the, and where we would put them is we can we can slide those up or down the page if you will and you can have a third you could have a third train um, in the event that some point in the future you you increase your um, capacity at the plant that is to to increase your capacity requires you to have an amendment to your discharge permit with the state of Vermont so it's not as it's not a simple exercise, but it is it is possible to get more capacity, but we would leave you space. We'd slide all that down and leave you space to have a third train uh, for future growth. Thank you. Yep. I could leave this up if everybody wants, or I could pull it back on. 
And then can you talk about how you would, how would the final design work? How would you work with the town as a process kind of comes from 90% to 100%? Oh, I didn't mean to stop here. I was going to show the, the schedule for that one. I have that up as well. Let me share back screen again, and I'll talk through through how that works. So already, you know, we did. Um, if you noticed in the scope of work that sent over, that um, we did add in a feature for energy coordination. So with with Jill and with Harry and yourself and the town working to identify and meet the goals uh, that are somewhat, you know, they they go with this plant. There's gonna be a lot of energy upgrades inherently. What Kirsten was talking about, the more efficient blowers and more efficient pumps, but then there's, how do you heat the buildings? How do you collect energy on site? How do you, um, you know, a, a number of uh, digital services, like uh, digital services could be really a, an interesting, I think something that might be of real interest to the town of Woodstock, where you can, uh, that's where we're talking through flex load management. And you know how how you can uh, offset the cost of electricity and, and and gain benefits there. So we can get into more details on that. But that's that's something that we would do continuously in smaller groups, uh, and then and then working through on on bigger milestones. So the the big first step right here is what we're pushing for to get going on is the public outreach process, and that has a number of you know a number of connection points with the town. Uh, where we would do public uh, presentations on the project to help get the, you know, we already did, we did that one uh, for the select board informally, um, just getting everybody up speed on how the report ended. That was back in January. Uh, but we do maybe some more uh, emphasized, uh, maybe around the project to help get support uh, for it. Um, and let me see here. So, so really getting into, oh, I don't have these all collapsed. But essentially, you know, what, what you do is right after, as we go into design, we would have a number, you know, we the meetings of regularity would be with Tim and your staff to make sure the, you know, the operators are going to have a, a large amount of say through the basis of design and then through the conceptual design all the way through, you know, but as far as the key milestone points where, where there's going to be larger productions, it's 30%, 60%. And 90%, that's where those deliverables that get reviewed by the state happen. And that's that's a good point for the kind of that big step back, work with, you know, have the select board see what's happening. Um, if you want to have input at that point, those are those are good kind of milestone points to keep in mind. Kirsten, do you want to jump yeah, in? Yeah, I do. Um, one thing I really like to do is I like to engage the operators, the people who are using this facility on a day by day, you know, day to day basis. I mean, ultimately, I'm not running the plant for them. They're going to be running it. So it needs to really have a lot of operator input um, and uh, and and their and their buy in on um, what equipment we're designing around, um, whether or not we're going to go for some kind of pre procurement on a on a proprietary type of a, a piece of equipment. Um, here's an example. This doesn't apply to you guys, but um, a lot of times, some of the bigger pieces of equipment, like the SBR system for South Woodstock, you know, you you design around a particular manufacturer because if you left that open to competitive bid um, during, you'd have change orders during construction because all the different SBRs are different. Are you know, they're all very slightly different. So that's just an example, but um, we would we would work with them and then. Usually, like around the sixty percent, well, between thirty and sixty, we really like to sit down with the owners, the operators, and kind of go through the functional use of each space. Like we'll have design workshops with the process engineers, but also with the architects to say, how do you want to use this space? What is most important to you? Uh, we do that as well with mechanical engineers. Um, so that we have um, the right kind of heating, cooling, whether or not we want to explore effluent heat, you know, exchange that that that's a thing that uh, Hoyle Tanner's designed down at Brattleboro Wastewater Treatment Facility is working great for them. It's something we're looking at for our Bartlett Bay facility up here in South Burlington. Um, so we start to talk about how the spaces are conditioned. We talk to the electrical and instrumentations engineers. We bring them in and we talk about how do you want this to be controlled? And we didn't, 
I didn't, I haven't talked with you, with you all about digital services, but there's a new push to have, um, I'm going to call it, it was like instrumentation and controls. And we call it digital services in the sense that you're taking real time data from instrumentation that's in your tankage, say a dissolved oxygen uh, sensor. And that this is, a, here's a simple example that dissolved oxygen sensor is reading real time levels in the tanks and it's it's fed into a, a feedback loop with the blowers to control the rate of air so that you're not over aerating. Um, so you're not sending too much air and you're sending just the right amount of air. That's a simple uh, a simple loop, but there, there can be more uh, complicated ones where you have a plant that sees a lot of II and you can go into a storm mode so that you are ahead of time kind of loading up your solids inventory in the aeration tanks so that you're not washing solids out of your secondary clarifiers during a wet weather event. Um, and it uses predictive analytics. It uses AI, which could be a little scary, but it's it's actually acting as another operator. It is assisting your operators to weather these wet weather events or to optimize the plant for energy efficiency for operational costs, energy costs, um, for chemical usage. And uh, you can do a lot of optimization to achieve those things using these kind of digital services of what we call. So we like to have these workshops at that point in design to really engage and get, uh, get buy-in um, with the people who are using the plant. Is that, any questions? Any questions from the board? Jill has a question. Well, I was only sure the board has been a lot. Okay. Jill? Um, I was wondering what the logic was for doing public engagement so early before the vote. And let John talk to that. Sure. Yeah, it, it takes it takes a long time for um to allow people to to both ask questions and then we already have a pretty nicely compiled list of frequently asked questions. Uh, but there would be a website developed. There might be some uh, site visits or plant tours, potentially that we could record this summer. I was kind of thinking that maybe that would be something to go up on the website for people who can't, because you can't take everybody in the public to walk around and see see the needs. But you're trying to get, you know, a successful vote, a successful passing vote. And what we found, and we just recently had this in in Milford, where we did a very a similar project, where we went through a, a nice, a, a proper process to educate the public on the on the project and allow them to ask questions and get feedback so that by the time they were going to vote, they really felt they had a good understanding and it, it did pass. So that's that's why we like to to give a good duration for that. I, I, the only thing that comes to mind is that we are potentially going to have a vote on the water company acquisition too, and that might conflict with it. Might be could be helpful, could not be helpful. There's there's some strategizing to do with regards to what you want to put on what ballot, and I think uh, multiple projects do want to consider um, when when the best time is, when the optimal time. November has been something that we targeted last fall when talking with Eric that it's a good it's, it's a presidential vote, so you're going to have a good voter turnout. Mm -hmm. So ideally... I wasn't that's not, I wasn't talking about the vote time. I was talking about the. Um... There's potentially two streams of information coming to people about two different subjects, two different dates for votes. So that's the strategy, strategizing that needs to be done. Or are you saying you you know combine maybe the outreach with with both mm -hmm. projects? So like if there is a website created, are you saying like having a dual feature there, Jill or no? I was I was worried about overloading actually, and maybe thinking what one viewpoint could be. Don't talk about the wastewater treatment plant until August. That is really a discussion to be had with the town as to prioritization mm -hmm. or, or to what yep. what strategies could be. I mean, both have needs, right? Um, so it's um, I would say you know we 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 come from our perspective of of the wastewater plant and see what needs to be done out there. So we're biased. Uh, and yeah, and I think if and when the town decides to go forward with Will Tanner, that that probably be the first conversation we had uh, with the board and Will Tanner. What we wanted to do. 
Now, I will also say like the bond vote doesn't have, you can continue to advance design. So the way the CWSR program works is when you get the loan for design, you get five years before you have to start making your first payment. So it's a, it's a 0% loan on design phase services that eventually gets rolled into the construction. So let's say construction starts at year four, you roll the design into that, and then you can begin paying back uh, with that whole loan program. So, so it's, you could, you could complete design. The, the, the requirement is you can't advance to step three for construction until you have an approved bond vote by the town. So that is another option for the town to consider strategy wise as to when you put the bond vote out. And we have done bond votes more towards our final design portion of the project, but we've also done them before we even start design. So it's the, 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 the only risk is, is if you push it later, um, the design has already gotten to a good point. And if there's anything that changes and you have to revert back on something or modify something in the design, it could it could expand up the, the design costs or the schedule. Yeah. Wendy, you had a question, comment? Thank you, Eric. Yes, I have a um, comment and a question. Um, I wanted to follow up on Jill's concern. Uh, I have a different take. Um, I I believe we need to understand our infrastructure planning uh, of water and sewer together. I, I do, I'm a village resident, I'm a water <clears throat> and sewer user, but uh, I see them, I see water and sewer, that they go hand in hand. Um, I, I've been involved in other municipalities where <clears throat> the building is actually handled Similarly, where there's a relationship, but by one department, um, there's a relationship between water use and sewer use. So as, as in terms of information, I do really don't see how we can exclude one from the other. We can't have, we don't have a sewer system without water. Um, so that's just my two cents on these big decisions that we have coming <clears throat> up. Second, my question is about um, this plan and capacity for future uh, connecting, so expansion. And one thing that I feel happened recently um, with the turning down of the school bond vote is too many questions on what the sewer system can handle or what we can handle. So my question is, what would potentially a new school connecting with a higher projected student capacity to the sewer system, um, how would that use up, quote, um, that 500 uh, what, uh, connection potential, uh, as well as the other buildings that are currently on hold in the community, um, how much would that eat into the projected 500, that number? Is that, did I make my question? Yeah, and and I can answer. I can answer a little bit. Um, I don't know what the what the projected student uh, population for you know for an expanded school is. So that's hard for me to know what your projected wastewater flows from that expanded. Well, they're saying maybe one hundred and twenty more students. Like roughly, they were working upwards. Okay, at it, just roughly. So let me just uh, let me get like yeah. big picture. Yeah. The plant right now is operating at only 50% of its hy as hydraulic capacity. Oh, okay. So there is capacity at the plant. Um, you know, previously Eric has asked us like, well, how many, how many units could we build? And there's more capacity than than just 500. And I don't have the numbers. I wish I did at my fingertips, but basically you look at it, it, your threshold is 80 percent of your permitted capacity, which is your permitted capacity is 0.45 million gallons per day. You're operating at like 0.225. Okay. So there's there's a lot there, but you have to hold you have to hold some in reserve. Like the state, if you start bumping up against 80% of that design capacity, that kicks you automatically into um an upgrade kind of planning. Um, so like I said before, 
there could be, you know, the solution could be to ask for more of a discharge, you know, more flow from your from your plant. Um, and the the design would allow that kind of phased incremental, you know, capacity to to meet that. But for the next 20 years, it's it has not been identified that you need to build this tankage that won't be used in the next 20 years. The cycle of a treatment plant is about 20 years for equipment. Tankage, sure, that lasts 50 plus years, you know, concrete things, pipes in the ground, but the equipment itself with technology is really obsolete after about 20 years. Okay. Thank you. I'm not sure if that answered your question. Well, it, it's I'm hearing that the that the current um new properties that are on, waiting to go online with water and a projected possible building of an increased size school um there's room. I'm hearing we're not going to use up what you're planning. Exactly. Like you're not going to be exceeding your permit on day 1. Got it. Thank you. Wendy, I was on the aqueduct working group and we were interested in who was using what percentage of water in the town and the schools are a very small user of water, actually. Thank you, Carrie, for that. Um, Cause I, I was wondering about, you know, and as they projected their own expenses, what that looked like. Yeah, uh, so in I think budget. we, I, I'm trying to find the, the breakout, but um, Institutional users that includes all the all the schools, the churches, it only uses twelve point eight percent of the water. Okay. Annually. Thank you. So so my worries are not in that are 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 uh, assuaged. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> are there any other comments, people, publicly, Stephen? Hey again, uh, Stephen Bauer, Director of uh, Planning and Zoning. Um, <clears throat> so a couple things, just we are continuously working on upgrading our planning. That is part of, the, that is why I'm here. Um, so what I hear is that the life cycle of a wastewater treatment plan is, is somewhere, some parts of it is 20, some parts is 40 up to 50. Um, but I, the remaining questions that I want to work, work closely um, with Hoyle and Tanner is, is is uh you know what is is understanding what is the cost of the increased capacity now paying for that increased capacity now that if if you were asking just my opinion uh, is is coming we don't know exactly how quickly and exactly how much but it is coming um, paying for that now versus when we already get there uh, is there a benefit uh, I like to hear that we're that that the that the design is is planning for growth and that there is you know, there is a part, what my fear is, is, uh, you know, do we sub submit a bond to the voters that three to five years from now, uh, because all these planning, uh, all these, all this planning has, has come to, and we've been able to attract development. Um, do we then come back to the voters? And now that, uh, that increased capacity uh, for another tank is now going to cost uh, an extra 10 to $20 million. Uh, we don't know that numbers. That's not a conversation that I've been having with Hoyle Tanner. Um, um, the capacity for 500 connections sounds, sounds great. Um, you know, but I, I think it's, we all know that the, the connections are not equal. A studio apartment does not require the same as, as a brewery. We're not just talking about adding uh, capacity for just students or those students' families that move to the, to the area. We're talking about industry. We're talking about where are those people going to work? Um, there's gonna be people that are added to the school that's teachers, that's police officers, that's fire department, uh, that's uh, potentially manufacturing, uh, that is uh, breweries, restaurants, uh, retail stores, um, all of those. We, we don't understand that because we haven't been necessarily talking about what is that actual growth. Uh, I love hearing that capacity for 500 connections, potentially more, uh, that we're only at 50% capacity. That, that's, a, that's a good thing. Uh, but I, what I can't hear and what I can't say right now is, if we add 2,000 people over the next 10 years, um, we absolutely have nothing to worry about at our at our main wastewater treatment plant. If we extend East End uh, beyond the borders of the village, um, do we have the capacity to get wastewater to those units that go beyond that? 
Um, so that's, again, not something that, that we know right now, but we need to be investigating. These are the questions that I have. Um, so that capacity for growth um, may limit our ability. Uh, this, this is a concern or a fear, is does that capacity of growth, um, do we get to a point where we're, we're potentially limiting um, uh, our department, Eric, you know, as a town to, uh, to market Woodstock to potential developers? Uh, we need housing. Um, continuously try and work with development. And one of the questions that always comes up is how's your capacity? Um, I like the idea of relying on a statement from Hoyle Tanner to say, look, we've got capacity, um, but this is exactly how I know how much capacity we have. If you're looking to build 10 units, 20 units, 50 units, um, can I say with relative certainly certainty in two to five years, we can provide that. Um, so that's just part of the thing as uh, as part of my job and things that I think about in planning for our future growth uh, that keep me up at night. Uh, and so just questions that we that we still have and, and work that I'm willing to do. And I know Hoyle Tanner is, is willing to do and, and you guys are, too. So thank you. Thank you. I, I have a couple of uh, just follow ups to that. Um, so we can totally work with your planning department to relook at um, projected growth over the next 20 years and beyond. We do this all the time for other communities. For Here's a great example. City of Burlington is starting to do a lot of infill, you know, uh, looking for more more housing. That's a, that's a huge goal of the city here. So like one of the projects I'm doing with the city is to look at the south end uh, development area I mean, we're we're projecting wastewater flow rates for multiple unit housing, student housing, restaurants, daycares, you, you name it, anything that's going to go in the south end uh, quadrant. We're projecting flows out to, you know, out to 50 years from now. We're looking at their sewer capacity to see if they can hand, even handle that additional flow. And so if, if I have um, this is if I had like what kind of potential growth and number of units, if it's a studio, if it's a two bedroom, three bedroom, four bedroom, if it's a school, you know, how many, how many new students, restaurants, manufacturing, brewer, I can develop wastewater flow rates for you on a horizon for the next 20 years, 30, 40, 50. And that way you can make informed decisions about what you want to have your, what your, your plant, build your plan out for. And I'm not saying doing it now, but we could also um, then look at, well, what would it cost you to build that third train, but not put the equipment in it? You know, like the tankage, what would it cost you um, for that incremental uh, increase in capacity, even though you're not necessarily asking the state for an expanded permit right now? Those are totally things that we can do. I think that latter part's the key part as to why, you know, through this, the the project right now as it exists because you still have capacity. You're not you're not hitting at the edge of it right now. You you do have it'll take some time for the growth that was just, just discussed. That the needs currently are are satisfied by the project as defined the study, but allowing for that space and dashed out lines of where potential future growth could go. I think the I don't I don't know if I would and this comes into the strategy again, if you would bond for an additional amount that allows for future growth. In a future project, you, you don't want to spend the money too much on stuff that you're not using yet. It just sits there in ages. So I think the goal is to maybe in the pipe sizing that we use throughout the plant, uh, the network of, of things or the pumps or, or you make, making sure that if it's a little bit of an increment in size to make sure you can handle future growth, that might be where, but building in the additional uh, parts of the plant right now might not be the best use of the town's money. Um, the other part, too, that uh, to think about, along with it takes time to get the permit uh, for your discharge permit, to increase that and to work with, uh, you know, DEC and EPA as to what your limits would be associated with that and then potentially bringing in Act 250. Um, that's that's a, that's a process that would that that takes time and comes with risk. So as far as doing that, that's down the road. I do think, though, that there is a change of thought and with communities in Act 250, and if you if established, uh, you might you know more about this net in the planning department, but like if you have like a, a growth plan, like if you have a master plan in place, then I think that that conversation is a little easier. The other part to think about, too, with that, Steve, is um, 
the collection system and conveyance system, I think uh, it, it depends on where in, in, in the community and how you're getting it to the plant. And that comes with, uh, you know, so we, we can work. Uh, there's a lot more discussed. Kirsten is the right person. She, like she said, she's done this in other communities. So maybe that's something we do through that. I think that would be an important thing to do through that public outreach process. We also, you know, that user rate coordinating with the town on sewer use ordinance and user rate study coordinating with your future growth plans so that those questions are properly responded to through the outreach and it's not something that um, that lingers into the bond vote. Now I could just add one thing. John, you and I trade emails about this, uh, I think back in December, um, and you said, don't quote you, but I'm gonna kind of quote you on this um, <laughs> just a little bit. Uh, but the question I asked was if we tried to increase capacity by a thousand connections to 2000 connections um, and you, projected uh, a rough estimate of the project going from 20 million to about 30 million um, at that time. Um, so that's kind of just a, a, a idea of what the actual cost would be uh, if we wanted to build in that capacity uh, immediately. Um, so that's just what we had talked and about. And that's back in napkin. I mean, we could, we, could, we could do a cost estimate for a third train easily enough, but that's that was kind of like off the cuff. Yeah. Third, third train, third clarifier, and we were assuming tertiary. Yeah. So yeah. You know, all of those components together, that 10 million. Yeah. Are there any other questions from the board members or members of the community? Uh, I think Wendy has one more. Wendy? Thank you, Eric. I'm not quite sure who to address this question to, Actually. but my understanding is this wastewater treatment plant upgrade does not include what John just referred to as the um, passageways or conduits. But anyway, the the pipes that lead to the plant. Right, correct. It does not include any upgrades to your sewer collection system. So my question to Eric and the select board is, how is the, our community going to address those future expenses and who pays for that? You don't have to answer me right now, this minute, but it's part of this bigger problem we're, we're embracing. Yeah, I think, Wendy, we're, we're focusing right now on um, the final design with Hello Tanner, but you are correct in, you know, large, large picture, big picture um, infrastructure needs of the community and how we fund those is something we've been talking about internally. And we'll continue to talk about it as we go forward. Uh, Susan, you had a question? Oh, so my understanding is our next step with Coil Tanner is to address the agreement between owner and engineering for professional services. And since we are, I, I guess I just want to know, or I, I think it would be helpful to understand what agreement we're presently under and what this next step does. Eric, do you want me to go or? Yeah, John. Okay, all right. Uh, yeah, so so currently we're we're not under agreement. We completed our our last agreement uh, at the closure of the step one preliminary engineering report. So what what's in front of you right now, and, and it's kind of nicely packaged in step one, step two, step three, the way the water investment division looks at things and the CWSRF program. So what we have proposed in front of you is the step two, the final design phase, and step three is construction phase. So. Um, you know, this would allow us to be under contract with the town to begin working on those services um, and continue to push the project uh, towards advancing through final design. And the schedule, basically, the, the schedule that we had proposed puts final design completion around the April of 2026 timeframe to allow for construction to begin maybe some elements in the summer of 26, uh, but then going through 27 primary, that, that would be the, the, the larger construction season. Um, so Susan, did I answer that completely or uh, let me come back to your question, make sure I got that. I think so, unless anyone else has questions. And I think Eric had also mentioned just kind of briefly talking about South Woodstock. Oh. Well, there were concerns that um, that went um, over what was bonded. And I, I think you yep. probably want to discuss your role in that. Okay, so I, I can talk to that his, yeah. history. So um, the previous engineer, uh, Stantec, 
performed a, um, a value analysis of the treatment, the existing treatment facility and came up with alternatives and a cost estimate. Um, that report was January of 2020. We were hired um, shortly thereafter in the spring to evaluate that report, do an analysis of it and provide concurrence on the recommended project and the cost estimate. And we prepared a, um, a, a technical memo, a letter to the town uh, with our review and our findings. And that was dated in March, actually about, uh, about four years ago, March 17th, 2020. And in that report, we kind of looked at all of the different um, assumptions and and uh, recommended project and their opinion of costs and identified in our le letter the major deficiencies with that analysis. And I can talk to some of them. I don't like um, pointing out the flaws in another engineer's work, um, but the analysis was wholly inadequate. Um, there was, they did not include any mechanical screening um, for like a headworks to keep um, large items out of the treatment process. They did not, um, they did not include redundancy on, on blowers or pumps. They did not include the concrete, cost of the concrete for the SBR tanks. They did not include the cost to pump the wastewater flow up to an SBR. They did not consider that there was bedrock eight feet below the ground surface, which would require pumping to a higher level. They did not include the constraints of the regulatory floodway, which shrinks the size of available land that the treatment practice could be placed on. They did not include um, the cost for disinfection. They were gonna reuse the existing tankage which did not meet Vermont state standards for disinfection nor redundancy. So those things, just those items were needed to be added to the project. And then I, mean, I, I forwarded this letter, our letter to Eric and he could share it with you on how we found uh, that presentation not adequate to suit the needs for this treatment facility. And it had already gone to bond, right? It had already gone to bond. Right, got involved. Yeah. I can so make basically, it's, so I say publicly, Hoyle Tanner was not responsible for the overage on the South of Woodstock uh, bond and, and the cost of that. And if I could make a request for the minutes to, to stricken the name of the other firm, I don't, I don't think sorry, it's fair. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know you didn't mean to, yeah, but I don't think it's fair to, I, I think Kirsten laid out all the reasons why the bond was inadequate. And I think that's fair. I don't, uh, I just don't want to. Yep. I apologize. Allow, not allow them to speak up for themselves. I don't know what went into their study nor, you know, so, yeah, no, you, you're fine. <laughs> I just, if, if that's, a, if that could be done, I think that's fair to. Yeah, that's fine. And can I ask one more question before we, uh, I think, conclude this? Um, is it possible for an analysis and a cost estimate to be added to the agreement for increased pipe size, increased pump size, updated collection system, uh, a third pump holding station, increased capacity permits? So is that possible uh, like after the board technically signs this or is it? Yeah. Yeah, we can work, uh, you know, so there's still, so um, I, you don't need to sign this today, actually. Like there's so... We yep. need actually approval from the Water Investment Division. It's with Wynn Wilson. He's started his review last week. Uh, we just got to get some comments back. Typically, they're very minor comments, um, but then we can make slight adjustments. I could add in a scope line to work with the town and, and with Stephen uh, around the growth plans and future projections. Uh, so, so we have a foundation of of what that should be, Kirsten. I think that would be properly done in this pre-design phase before, you know, and it's good to do during prior to the bond vote so that it shows that's been accounted for in what the town is voting for. So yeah, Kirsten, I think I could work with you to come up with a good list of scope. It doesn't have to be, it wouldn't be a large change in the 
percentage of the contract value. Um, so I think what, what we'd be hoping for for today would be for the town to vote to allow Eric to move forward uh, with signing the, the engineering agreement uh, provided the CWSRF program uh, supports it and uh, within like maybe a range of like, you know, not to exceed another $100,000 above whatever, but what, what we had in there, but giving giving that comfort level. I think we're, we're going to be less than that. I just want to if there's if that's if that's how this could work for Eric to be able to move forward, that that could speed things up, or we could wait till the next meeting. Yeah. Well, the next step was to enter executive session to talk about. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you all. It's an executive session under one BSA, thirteen A one A. Discuss contract. Um, it will specific, specific finding the premature general public knowledge to clearly place the public body or person involved in substantial disadvantage. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Yeah. You're going to that now? Yeah. Sure. We're all here. Yeah, we're all here. We are open to the public. People will be. I'm not going to take a vote. No. Well, I move we adjourn. Uh, there's minutes. Oh, minutes. Sorry. Premature. So Susan did have one or two corrections that she sent to us ahead of time that Nikki has updated. Uh, it's not in the packet, but it will be shown in the final minutes. Correct. Yes. Yeah. And I can. I, I didn't send that to everybody. I no, I believe it was just to me and I forwarded yeah. it along to Nikki. So the only changes were that um it listed someone present that I think it was actually a parent that was present. And then the um Crowdy parade permit was conditioned on an insurance certificate. Yes. Yeah. So great. Okay. Those have been made. I make a need a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Second. Second. And to be clear, it's the minute. Because there's two sets of minutes, your preference yeah. were just on one. So the minutes are February 2nd and February 5th. Oh. Oh. On February meeting. Is there a second? Second. second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Aye. All those in favor? Aye. 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 A